Welcome, my name is Rachel Pollock. I am a professor of costume production in the MFA program at UNC Chapel Hill. And um, I have one of my grad students here as my co-moderator, Lauren Woods. She'll be getting her MFA in costume production this spring. Um, all right, my, there we go. Um, first, I just wanna go over a little bit of, ah, I'm having problems. Um, a little bit of Zoom protocol here. Um, you have been muted coming into the room to minimize disruptions from background noise. Um, so if you have questions throughout the course of this presentation, feel free to type those into the chat window, which Lauren's going to be following. Um, she may know the answers because she's had my millinery classes and, and heard this lecture before. Um, so she may be able to answer your questions in real time. And if not, then at the very end, we'll have a Q&A session for anything that she's not able to get to or that doesn't fit easily into the presentation that she'll interrupt me. Um, I've had some folks question uh, how, this, this lecture is free. I don't expect anything at all, but I did have a couple of people ask how they could leave me a tip. Um, so here on this screen, you see the QR codes and IDs for my Venmo and PayPal. And I'll pull this up again at the very end of the lecture, because why would you give a tip for something when you haven't heard it yet? <laughs> but know that that will be an opportunity, but I don't expect money from anybody for this. Um, I know these are hard times right now, especially for many of us in the entertainment industry. Um, so enjoy the lecture. Here we go. Um, this is a, a photograph, which you can also see on, on the shelf behind me here, of uh, Madame Sheeta, who is a, she was a, a milliner in the West End of London in the early to mid part of the 20th century. And this presentation, the beginning of this presentation is about her life and career. Um, her given name was Ada Phillips Riddle, but she did business under the, uh, under the pseudonym of Madame Sheeta. She was at the height of her career. Um, she made hats for pretty much all of the traveling musicals, spectaculars, and pantomime shows in England, as well as contributed them to films. The uh, most famous one being The Red Shoes with Maura Shearer. Um, the picture on this slide shows a selection of some of the programs from the shows that she did hats for that she kept and saved in her archive of her business. Here is a photograph of Ada's family. She's the little girl in the center in the white dress, and that's her parents and her older brother, Teddy. Um, she was born in 1910. Her father, a man named Ad uh, Edward Phillips, owned a motorcycle repair shop in a borough of London called Croydon. Um, the motorcycle was very a, a relatively new development at the time. It was um, invented at the end of the 19th century and really was coming into mass production right at the time in which um, Ada was born. The family is for all intents and purposes, from what I can tell from the archive, it was a very happy family until tragedy struck in 1925 when Ada's older brother, Teddy, was killed in a motorcycle accident. Um, he was two years her senior and she really looked up to him. Um, and when he died, she really struggled with how to deal with his death. Um, it's sort of a common uh, reaction for young children when they suffer, or for teenagers when they suffer a death. Um, they, they don't know how to deal with the grief. And so she began to skip school. She started smoking and drinking and running around with uh, the rest of the boys from Teddy's Cycle Club, including a young man who would go on to become her husband uh, named Bill Riddle. Now, the way that the um, educational system worked in England at the time and probably still works, um, you go through secondary school up until you're 17 years old. And then if you are going to go on to university, you take some exams and presuming you pass them, you go on to study at a university. But in 1927, the majority of people did not go on to the university. They would learn trades at trade schools and, and apprenticeships. And it's really when Ada is, is not doing well in school because she is struggling with the loss of her brother. Um, but it's really once she gets out of school and, and starts trying to, to see what path her life is going to take, that 
she really gains some control back over the direction of her life. Um, 1927, she enrolls in a millinery course there in Croydon, and she loves it. It's great. She passes the certificate program and decides that this is uh, the career for her. So after she gets that certificate, she's qualified to apply for apprenticeships at professional millinery studios. And her first one is at a, a, a milliner called Henri S.C. in Bond Street in London. She does so well at that, she signs up for another, or she is awarded another apprenticeship, rather, um, at a, a somewhat larger millinery studio called Chez Charlotte. That um, She works at the location in the Burlington Arcade, but they did also have another location in Bond Street. And uh, she learns a lot from both of these apprenticeships to the point that in 1931, she opens her own boutique under the name Madame Sheeta Model Millinery in the borough of Croydon. Now, you might, uh, well, I did question, where does this name Madame Sheeta come from when your name is Ada, doesn't really correlate. Um, but then come to find out, I, I wound up getting in touch with some of Bill's relatives, surviving relatives, her husband, Bill. Um, and her, Bill's nephew told me that Sheeta was a, a name, sort of a, an insult that Bill, a derisive name that Bill would use, because apparently they had very strong love for each other, but they also really fought, like the kind of couple where, you know, one minute they'll be kissing each other and hugging each other, and then they get in a fight and they're throwing dishes and pulling hair. And he called her Sheeta after the tigress in the Tarzan tales. And he meant it kind of uh, snide and snotty. And she really embraced that moniker and to the point that she turned it into her professional name under which she's making hats, Madam Sheeta. Um, and a little aside for the image on this slide, these are hats made by several of my graduate students in the most recent millinery class that I made. And I included this because a lot of the, these styles are similar to a lot of the hat designs uh, that I found renderings for in the Madame Sheeta's archive. So this blue and brown one here at the top, this one was made by Lauren, our co-moderator. So, she opens her own studio, 1931, and um, given that at the time, you know, people who work as professional milliners now, there's not uh, such a universal demand for handcrafted millinery. You know, if you go to the races, you go to uh, certain kinds of weddings, maybe you need hats, um, but for everybody to put on a hat to go to the grocery store, those are, are more mass produced factory made hats nowadays like baseball caps and such. Uh, but if you think about it in 1930s, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, everybody's buying hats from milliners. So she's starting out catering to a retail market. Um, but the retail market is fickle. If, if your collection of designs doesn't appeal to the public, then you don't sell them and you've just wasted your time. And I think, I, I'm, this is conjecture, conjecture, but I believe that she realized that she could um, lock down a secure income stream by in addition to making her own millinery designs for the public for sale, that if she could teach millinery, then that's a regular sort of income from doing these classes. So in 1935, she teaches her first millinery class at her alma mater, the Croydon School of Art and Craft. And she does something innovative um, the next year. She arranges art exhibits for the displays of her students' work, not fashion shows, art exhibits. So the hats are uh, exhibited in a, a stable format, in a gallery format. Um, she winds up teaching at seven different art schools, trade schools and colleges over the course of her entire career. Um, and the illustration for this slide I found on the inside cover of one of the course catalogs from her um, teaching career. And I, I just put it in here because, you know, these trade schools, they teach all kinds of artisanship trades from pottery to jewelry making to carpentry and woodworking uh, to millinery. But I, I thought it was interesting. Members of His Majesty's Forces in Uniform are admitted free to the evening classes. I just loved thinking that imagining maybe one or two soldiers would take advantage of the fact that they could learn millinery. <laughs> 
This is from her passport from the year 1937, this image. Um, and, and this, I've, I've sort of arranged a whole slide around this because this is a real turning point in her career. Um, Ada is 27 years old when this photograph was taken and she's been working as a milliner for a decade already, um, which is kind of incredible to me in that, you know, when I teach millinery, I'm teaching it to people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, that they're just learning it for the first time and that she could have learned this trade at such a young age that she has a decade's worth of experience by this time is, is, is really wonderful. Um, she's been married to Bill Riddle for five years as of this photograph and been teaching millinery in Corden and the borough of Bromley for two years. This is the year that um, she becomes an examiner for the Board of Education and Art um, which is the group that confers the diplomas on people who take the millinery classes and hope to be certified as a milliner's apprentices. Um, these classes, by the way, took around eight weeks where you're meeting for, uh, hers were Tuesday and Thursday, three hours in the evening. Um, so, you know, that, that's eight, hour, eight weeks worth of six hours a week before you can get certified in, in learning the basics of the millinery trade. Um, and the real key thing about this photograph and the turning point in her life that it marks is she's just produced hats at this point for her very first stage show, which was called 20 to 1 at the London Coliseum. And the way that, the, the way that hat making for that level of theater worked then and, and, well, I would say works now, but nobody's making theater right now, but theoretically, you know, if you get a Broadway contract and you get to make hats for a show that's on Broadway, you know that's likely, if the show's a success, that's gonna be a repeat money maker for you because not only do you have to rebuild it every time the role is recast, but then once they decide to send it out on tour, then you're probably gonna get tapped for all of those tour hats too. And so when she gets this job to do the 20 to one hats at the Coliseum, um, the company that, that did this also then sent Two, two tours of 20 to one out over the next five, six to five or six years. So this is her first opportunity to learn that theatrical millinery is a whole different world of um, potential income for her. So 1937, she has the opportunities to get uh, retail millinery designs sold to the public teaching millinery as an income stream. And now she's learning that theatrical millinery is also a viable income stream. So just real quick, what's going on in the world during these years of her life, which I love this process shot that was taken of her um, making a, a mock-up or a, the foundation of a Buckram and Wire hat. Um, 1914 to 1918, World War I is going on. Um, so that's when she's between the ages of four and eight years old. Um, and it's significant to, to her and to her family because World War I is the point at which the, the British Army replaced horses with motorcycles for couriers taking um, orders from the generals to the infantry at the front in battle. Um, so with her dad running a motorcycle shop, um, and the added visibility and, and patriotic visibility of the motorcycle at the time, um, she must have, uh, her family must have been paying very close attention to what's going on with respect to World War I. And, and that has to have um, influenced her psyche as a child. As we are all now, unfortunately, very familiar in 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic happened killing six million people across the globe. So these two very traumatic interludes um, in world history happen when she's very young in formative years. Um, but something that happens that probably was extremely inspiring to her, in 1929, women got the vote in the UK. And if you think about um, the history of the suffrage movement, that has to have been, you know, it starts in the 19th century. That's something that has, been a struggle that presumably she's been aware about her aware of her whole life and it's probably I think of it as maybe akin to how I felt about the Berlin Wall like growing up as a kid I knew it existed and that it was never going to fall and then sure enough it fell in 1989 and I was like wow I thought that would I thought that would never happen but it did and she must have felt the same way about 
the suffrage movement and when women get the vote in 1928, she doesn't get the vote because she's 18 at that time and the, the statute uh, says that you, women 21 and up can vote, but she knows once she comes of age that she'll be able to cast a vote. In 1936, King Edward abdicates the throne in order to marry Wallace Simpson. Um, now we know he was a big Nazi. Um, and speaking of Nazis, in 1938, Hitler invades Austria. So she's 28 then. The very next year, World War II begins. Now, before I, before I um, address this slide, I want to say I've given this lecture three times to my cat. <laughs> and every time I can't get through this slide without crying because it's, uh, it's really emotional and these are hard times. So let's not, please don't take this like it's weird and embarrassing. I'm aware that I'm about to get choked up about this. Um, so you see this picture of Sheeta walking um, the, the dog that she and Roy uh, that she and Bill owned, the dog's name is Roy. He's a German Shepherd. Um, so Ada and Bill, they both survived the Blitz of London when the German planes are bombing the city every single night and they have um, blackout uh, restrictions in place. You have to cover your windows. You can't be out on the street past nightfall. Um, and her, because she lives in Croydon and her shop is in Croydon, um, Croydon weathered the most Axis bombs of the campaign. I think some over 2000 bombs were dropped on Croydon in the span of like 10 months. And that's because um, the London airport at the time, this is before Heathrow was bought, the London airport was located in Croydon. So the German planes are wanting to bomb the crap out of that tiny area of London, hoping that they will hit some of the British planes on the ground um, and hoping that they may damage the airstrip so those planes won't be able to come to take off and, and fight back. Um, so Bill at this time during the Blitz, Bill joined the air raid wardens, which means that so when the sirens go off, the planes are coming, you can see the bombers are coming. Um, Bill would put on a uniform and go leave the house, go to his squadron station where he and other air raid wardens would help people who did not have access to bomb shelters and basements in the buildings where they lived or worked. He would help shepherd those people into uh, shelters, whether it was a bomb shelter, uh, a, a large public building that had a basement, the underground tube stations, and he would stay with those people in their shelters until the bombing raids had gone by. And so once the planes are gone and all the bombs have been dropped, then Bill's job and his other air wardens would uh, go to the sites where the bombs had exploded and look for survivors. So this picture, I, I know all this because there was a note uh, written in pencil on the back of this photograph um, that Ada and Roy would stay behind in the basement of their own house and just snuggle together. So I thought that was really sweet. Don't think, though, because of wartime restrictions, that she was suddenly not working as a milliner anymore. Because a lot of industries converted to support the war effort. You know, you no longer could make a gown with six yards of fabric. You had uh, fabric use restrictions and fashion um, sewing factories would turn to sewing uniforms for soldiers and other soft goods needed by the military. Um, but for Ada, she still maintained a viable career of as a milliner because even though the government initially shut down the theaters when war was first declared, they pretty quickly realized that the theater helped the populace keep their morale up. And they realized that they had to reopen the theaters and even though the theater couldn't run at night due to the blackout restrictions, they ran two shows a day, six days a week. So they actually were doing more theater during the war than they were beforehand when you would have evening performances and a couple of matinees. Um, so she wound up doing six hats for 16 musical reviews and ballets. 
She also did hats for six propaganda films produced by the Allied Forces and four Hollywood movies produced by MGM Studios. Um, one thing that I noticed that I found really remarkable, I guess, a, a sign of the times in the invoices, um, especially for these propaganda films, she was partly paid for her work with extra ration coupon books. So if you think about austerity measures and how, you know, you can't, you can't get a stick of butter unless you have a coupon for a stick of butter. And even if you have the money to buy three sticks of butter, if you don't have three coupons, you're not going to get the sticks of butter. Well, I mean, maybe on the black market, but um, the fact that they would pay her not just in money, but also in ration coupons um, gives her a, a level of compensation that is almost luxurious in, uh, I would say actually luxurious in a time of such austerity. So let's uh, talk really quick about her post-war life. Um, she and Bill split up a couple of years after the war. And um, I spoke with, well, I spoke with the executor of her estate, which we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and, and her friends um, were, were uh, talked about how devastated she was when Bill left her and uh, that she never remarried. She continues to work in the theater and the film industries and she doesn't retire from she she quits doing things for um theater and film and performance um at the end of the 50s beginning of the 60s but she doesn't retire from teaching millinery until 1980. now there was a little bit of a scandal that i found when i uh contacted bill's family surviving family members um bill according to his nephew he and Ada, once they split, they never spoke to each other again, and he n had nothing but vitriol to say about Ada. Um, he was, a, his, his nephew said he was misogynistic about her. Um, yet, he died of a stroke in 1986, and when his will was read, they, his family discovered that he and Ada had never gotten an actual legal divorce. They just split up um, and he never changed his will. So when Bill died, Ada inherited the entirety of his estate, which was not insubstantial, it was about 100,000 pounds. Um, she died peacefully at home in 1907, shortly before her 97th birthday. So now let's switch focus of this presentation to how did I become the person who is now, I guess, the steward of her biography and uh, legacy. Um, first, it starts with, there's, there is a very rare millinery material called espartari or willow or spartra, which you may or may not have heard of, and I will talk about it in depth here in a moment, uh, but the thing you need to know about how I became the steward of Ada's uh, life mem memory um, and, and, and archive is that when I became the milliner at the theater I currently work at, Playmakers Repertory Company, I had read about, uh, I had read about this material, Espartary, and I had learned about it in the first millinery class I took in 1992. Um, and I I didn't see it in person. We didn't work with it because the books were based, my teacher was like, this millinery material existed. It was great. It had all these wonderful properties, but they don't manufacture it anymore. And I'm just teaching you about it because you might come across a sheet of it someday. And I want you to know what you're looking at. Um, so I, I read about it extensively, but I'd never seen it in person. But when I started working at Playmakers and I went through the inventory of the millinery studio, I found three sheets of it and I knew what it was because I had read about it and seen pictures of it. So because I'm working there as a theatrical milliner though, I didn't immediately experiment with it because when you work in, as a hat maker for the theater, you make the hats that the show needs to have made that the designer has created the designs for and if those hats, whatever hats those materials need 
to be made from is what you make them from. So I just sort of filed it away. Well, literally filed it away, but also filed it away in my mind that I have these three sheets of this and knowing what I have read that it can do when a show comes up with hats that need it, then I'll try working with it. Well, that show came up in, in uh, 2010. It was The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. And the costume designer had created, uh, had drawn a couple of hat designs that I thought could be best executed using aspartory for the brim shapes. Uh, so I took a half a sheet of aspartory to make this, uh, this brim block that you see here at the right. And um, it, it worked. It worked great. It worked just like they said it would in the book. And um, I blogged about it in my blog, which at the time was hosted in live journal, which is what you see here at the left. Um, and, and we'll talk about what you do with aspartory at the end of this lecture as well. But so I posted about this one chance that I had to use it and I used it and it worked, posted it and didn't think about it again. Well, Sheeta passed away in 2007 and uh, she when she died, she had no heirs. She had no, she and Bill had no children. She never remarried. She never had children out of wedlock, but she did have, you know, 30 years worth of teaching millinery to people, or 50, almost 50 years worth of teaching millinery to students, some of whom became her friends afterward. And in fact, one of her students, a woman named Jan Frost, um, they were such good friends that she uh, named her as the executor of her estate. So when she passed away, the important thing here is that Jan had taken millinery with Sheeta and she knew what aspartory was. So when she was uh, going through Sheeta's home and her studio and with an estate sale agent, figuring out what can we get rid of and sell and auction and so forth, she found this box of aspartory in Sheeta's studio. And she knew that she could contact the workshop of Philip Treacy or Stephen Jones, one of these couture milliners, uh, and offer it to them um, and that they would pay anything she wanted for it because they don't really manufacture it anymore unless you get it custom made, which is what I think Philip Treacy does. But anyway, um, she said to me that that felt wrong to her, that, that selling it for the most amount of money she could get to somebody who's career is such that they can actually afford to have it custom made, did not feel right. And she wanted to find someone who was a contemporary theatrical milliner who also taught students how to make hats and who also had worked with a spar tree before so that they would not just be flying blind. So she began Googling a bunch of terms like theatrical milliner, teacher, professor, aspartory, spartra, and she found my live journal post. <laughs> so she left a comment on that post, which I don't even blog on live journal anymore. It just exists there as an archive. And if somebody comments on an age old post, I get a notification. So I get this notification. You have a comment on your Willow Brim Block post. And it just says, I have a box of European aspartory in good condition. Are you interested? Well, yes, of course I'm interested. Um, and and she, didn't, she didn't want to give it to me for free. She wanted to be compensated for it, but she didn't, she knew she could sell it for however much she wanted to ask for it. But it was important that it, to her, and she does memory, that it come to someone who's like the contemporary equivalent of Madame Sheeta. And so I wound up speaking with uh, the accounting department at, at the school where I teach as to what sort of offer could we make her for this and, and impressed upon them what a, a unique opportunity it was for us to acquire this material. And um, long story short, a bunch of bureaucratic red tape got worked through and um, we wound up acquiring this box of 76 sheets of European stock aspartory, which I will explain what that means in a minute. And I also received a box with all of the photographs that I've shown you in the biographical part of this essay or of this uh, presentation. And that's not even scratching the surface. I have probably a hundred photographs from her life 
up until, you know, like the year before she died, she's like hanging out the window of her car, smoking a cigarette. I mean, I have all of the photographs that, that Jan Frost, her student and friend, uh, could find, as well as all the correspondence of her millinery business, all the invoices, um, all of the design renderings of the hats that she made over the course of the years that she was making hats for theater. Um, and they came in this box along with the aspartery, which this, uh, if, you, if you can see this uh, image on the slide, this was a note that I found pinned to one of the sheets and it says to be used for best work only. And that's her handwriting that is still pinned to that sheet of aspartery. Aspartery. Now I'd like to talk about what it is and what you can do with it. Now that I have so much of it and have been teaching my students with it for the past um, four years. Um, we'll talk about how to identify it in case you find it with a sheet of what you might think is a spartery in a drawer of an old millinery studio or an estate of someone like Madame Sheeta. And uh, I'll show you a couple of techniques that we use in the workshop when I teach my students how to use it. So it's a two ply foundation material that you use in making hats. The two layers are, are different compositions. One layer is what we would refer to in America as lightweight buckram. Um, and in Britain, they would call it crinoline. Um, it's basically, with, if you go to Joanne Fabrics and you ask for buckram, it's what they sell you. It's, it's like the heavy buckram that we use in theatrical millinery, but it's lighter weight um, and, and it's finer, finer threads or finer strands of, of the fiber that it's woven from. So that's one layer. The second layer is a, a woven straw composed of a type of grass called esparto grass, which this is a picture of it growing in the wild. Um, European made aspartery, which is the kind that I acquired from Sheeta's estate. The straw layer is made from this esparto grass, which only grows in the south of Spain and on the northern coast of Africa. So the, the, the climate in the world, in the whole world, that climate is what is conducive to it growing. Um, there is also, if, if you've read anything about espartery, which you might have, um, there's often... Um, phraseology where they talk about in these mid-century, you know, 19 books that came out in the, in the 1950s and so forth uh, after World War II. And they talk about, there's two types of aspartery being used at the beginning of the 20th century, the European style and the Japanese style. And uh, they're very, they're often very disdainful of the Japanese uh, manufactured aspartery. It's, it's, quote, inferior in quality. Uh, the European style is far superior. And uh, this, is, this is the language from these texts. And I always, you know, reading these books, I always just presumed that that was an artifact of, of World War II um, prejudice against a former enemy that because the Japanese were on the Axis side in World War II, that post-World War II, there would be um, some hostility toward Japanese-made products. You know, during the war, the, there was an embargo on Japanese goods, and you couldn't get the Japanese-style espartery, and they stopped making the European-style espartery because everything turned into manufacturing for wartime. Um, so esparto grass is, is starting to be used um, in packing ammunitions and so forth. And, and nobody has uh, the inclination to make these sheets of rare material that you're going to construct ladies' hats out of. Um, this swatch here on this slide, though, um, shows you the difference between the European style espartery and the Japanese style. Because when I found the three sheets of aspartery in the millinery studio of Playmaker's Repertory, I've, those, one of those sheets, well, all three of them, had a little sticker in the corner with Japanese characters and a logo. So I knew not only do I have three sheets of aspartery, but I have three sheets of the Japanese type of aspartery. So that's what I used to make my Brimblock 
that I wrote the post about. Um, and then once I acquired the, the Aspartri from Shita, which was the European style Aspartri, I was able to compare the two. And if you look at this swatch, this um, straw colored sample on the right or on the left is um, the stuff from Madame Shita. This is woven Esparto grass. It has a natural straw color to that layer. Now the backside is, is crinoline, same one to the other. Um, uh, baby buckram, lightweight buckram. So this is the Esparto grass side. This Japanese Espartery is created with a type of straw called Toyo straw, which if you've ordered straw hat bodies from um, millinery supply companies, there will often be an option to order a Toyo straw hat body. And that is woven from straw that is created from twisted paper. So the straw layer has a, um, a pliability to it because the paper has, is, you know, it's, it's created from pulp and then it's twisted into strands and then it's woven. It's, it's more pliable and bendable than the more stiff fibrous uh, stalks of grass in the European style. So when, when you read these resources that say the Japanese style is inferior to the European style, uh, what they mean is that the, the straw layer, the, the nature of the straw makes that layer more pliable and, and less stiff. So um, they, at, as someone who's now worked with both of them, they behave basically the same. There's slight te textural difference when you touch them. Um, so I would not say that one is inferior to the other. They are simply two different versions of the same kind of thing. So let's talk about what you can use a spartry for. And this list is um, composed of, of citations in uh, antique millinery texts that do address a spartry as if it's still being manufactured and anybody can get it, which technically it is. The Japanese are still manufacturing it. You can order it from... Australian millinery supply companies, um, and it's the Toyo straw kind. But anyway, the uses for it. The first, um, the first and, and I guess historically most common was as a foundation material that you use just like buckram. Um, this hat here that looks like a saucer, which I have on the shelf behind me here, um, that is uh, molded over a hat block, a contemporary hat block, just the same way that like when you work with buckram, you saturate it with water and it becomes pliable and you mold it over something and then it dries out and it becomes rigid again. Well, that's what, that works for aspartory too. You don't want to saturate it the way that you do buckram because then your two layers will come totally apart, but you missed it on the crinoline side, uh, on the buckram side, and that allows the starch, allow, the, the starch becomes activated such that it allows the two layers to move against each other and it allows it to take a form. So for this hat, I took a piece of aspartery and I just blocked it over this little saucer block from Guy Morse Brown, it's a contemporary block. Another use for it that um, is cited in a lot of these reference sources is taking the print of a hat or a hat block. And what they mean is making a copy of the topography of it. So if you look at this uh, straw hat here with this interesting onion dome crown, that is um, a straw hat, which I actually have it right here. Um, this is a straw hat uh, that was woven from slats of, of wood and straw, thin strips of wood and straw. It's a, a Chinese sunshade hat. And I thought that the, uh, the, sh the curvature and the shape of that crown, I thought they were really sophisticated in a, a way that was kind of reminiscent of those 1950s Dior hats where they're great big bowls on people's heads. And I wanted to um, see if I could take a print of this block. So I took um, a sheet of aspartery and I activated it and I managed to this hat, this existing hat, um, and when it dried out, it took the shape of it. And so now I, I have made a copy 
a three-dimensional copy of that hat using this aspar tree. Um, and I could then use this as a traditional millinery material and wire the edge and cover it with fabric. And then this becomes the hat, right? Um, but I could also turn it into a temporary hat block, which is what I did with the block that I blogged about. And when you do that, you take the shape that you have created and you stabilize it. Um, you can stabilize it with paper mache or with um, espartery fragment mache, little extra pieces of it, and build up layers in here um, so that it becomes hard and rigid enough for you to then shape another kind of millinery material over it, like buckram or cinnamon straw or felt or, you know, abaca straw and turn this instead of making a hat out of it, make it into a temporary hat block because you couldn't block industrial quantities of hat on it. It would allow you to see, allow you to make five or six hats on it and decide whether you actually wanted to carve it in wood or in foam or something. And then the final uh, use for it is represented by this hat shape right here, which is also up on this uh, shelf behind me. And the references call this forming in the hand. And this is um, the kind of millinery sculpture that Philip Treacy does, which is how I know he's working. Now that I've gotten my hands on it, I know he's, he's having his own Aspartray custom made and he's working in it. Um, or he's bought some old stock like I've got. Um, because once you activate the, the material, you can sculpt it and pin it out on a block or a head shape um, or just in your hand on the table um, and, and free form sculpt it. It takes complex curvature, not just curves in one direction, but curves in, in three dimensional directions. It takes those curves fantastically. And this is really the best, I think the best use for it now. It's not, we have plenty of excellent millinery foundation materials uh, that we can block on things. And we can even now, I have a grad student working on this, 3D scan existing hats or existing hat blocks and replicate them, um, carve it, digitally carving them on routers. So taking the print of hats and blocks and, and replicating them, you can do that quicker digitally now. And we have a lot of foundation materials that there's no real need to waste aspartery making the foundation for a hat unless it's just like an experiment for fun. But there's, I haven't found anything that does freeform millinery sculpture the way that aspartery does. So here are some pictures from the workshops. I've hosted two workshops now with my graduate students. Um, one four years ago and one two years ago, uh, because millinery class comes up every two years. Um, I'll be doing it this fall, but we won't be working with the spidery because of the pandemic. It's not really something you can teach remotely. Um, anyway, if you look at these shapes, it, I think it gives you a good visual example of all of the different kinds of three-dimensional sculpture that you can do with this stuff. And basically what these students have done, we missed the, the the buckram side of the aspartery, and then I have them just start playing with it, just start experimenting with it. So, you know, like this one here in the bottom left on the left side um, with all of these interesting draped swirls, um, she's got hair curlers in there, those like foam hair noodles supporting those curves while the aspartery dries after she's sculpted it. And then when she takes it off, she took this one off the block and turned it into a hat. Um, I don't make them all finish out the hats um, unless they want to, um, but some elect to. And here are three examples of completed hats made from a spa tree. This one on the left, um, our co-moderator, Lauren, made this one um, the last time I taught the millinery class. And I find that the students are really drawn to the natural straw color of the Esparto side of our Espartery. And often they, they leave that exposed. And in the, that's what Lauren's done in this case, the inside of this um, 
fascinator-esque thing is the straw side of the aspar tree and the back side she has uh, backed it with a silver brocade and bound the e wired and bound the edge for stability and then used silver cinema to create these calla lilies that are inside of it inside of this sort of sheaf of aspar tree the center hat uh, was manufactured using a traditional buckram crown so she blocked uh, this is a student named Danielle Soldat. She blocked a crown, uh, this sort of pencil point crown um, out of buckram and she shaped the brim for it with espartery. And if you look at uh, these really organic sort of shell-like curves that are happening, especially here at the back, that is a sort of a, an aesthetic visual signature of an espartery uh, brim shape. You could create that shape with other types of materials, but Aspartry does it really well. And then this third one, um, this is a traditionally blocked hat where she's essentially using Aspartry as if it were buckram, but the, the, this student, Michelle Bentley, was really responded to the aesthetic of the straw layer and wanted to, to play upon that in um, the finishing of this hat. So much like with Lauren's, the, the back side, the buckram side is covered in a two-tone uh, coral and gold brocade that she also used to bind this wired edge. And um, she used natural cinema straw to create these spiral ornament things that are, are seated in the plate of, of this hat. This is just like the one that I have blocked and in process uh, that I showed you from that previous slide. So let me address, we're going to talk about two different, how are we doing for time? 149. All right, well, we're good for time. Um, we're going to talk about two different uh, techniques for working with espartery um, and that I think are, um, well, from a milliner's perspective, they are uh, indicative of what a singular material it is. Um, and the first is called a skinned join. Uh, now, when you read about espartery in books from the mid-century, they often talk about uh, how advantageous its ability to take a complex curve is for creating a hat, a top hat that has a swooping sideband. So when you think about those uh, really extreme top hats that, that they swoop in at, at the crown and then flare back out at the tip of the crown, which this is a straw one, but this basic shape where it, it curves in and then flares back out, sort of a Tim Burton-y, gothic-y top hat shape. Um, Aspartery is really good at doing that, but you have to seam it together. So you cut it on the bias, you activate it, you can get it to take that swoop, um, and then you have a center back seam that you have to negotiate, which because it's on the bias, the best way to do it is have a diagonal seam up the back of the hat. Now you would missed, well, you've already missed it to get it, take that curvature. Um, and when you're reconciling your seam, you have to peel back the crinoline layer, overlap the asparto grass layer. And so through and through, I did two rows of stitches, as you can see in the bottom part of this. This is the back side, the wrong side, which I did this in black as a teaching sample so you can see the sewing. In actuality, you'd be doing this with a lighter colored thread that would just sort of blend into the material. Um, and you sew through and through with a back stitch, and then you smooth the crinolin, overleaf the crinoline so that the join becomes a sleek, smooth finish. If you just cut it raw and overlapped it and stitched it through and through both lay well, all four layers, then you'd have a little ridge along that seam that you'd have to reconcile or else, you know, in your mulling of that form, it, it's, you're going to see that sort of dimensionality of the material and the skinned join, the, the buckram layer is thin enough and sleek enough that you can smooth it down so nice at, that you can't tell there's a join there. And that is the first technique we want to look at. The second is a wired edge. Now, when you make a hat with buckram, um, buckram and wire, so you cut your buckram along what you think is the brim edge, and you sew wire along that. 
usually whip stitch it by hand or you might zigzag it by machine, but then you have to use a bias tape, bias tape sometimes called French elastic to enclose that wire along the edge of the buckram uh, so that it doesn't, the, the buckram is a, a loose weave, it's big holes, um, it's a woven, so it could just rip away if you don't enclose it in something. And then that um, bias strip is also a textile that you can pick up a stitch of when you're trying to sew your cover fabric onto the hat. Um, with espartery though, it sort of forms its own French elastic. So this wired edge, I misted it, peeled back the crinoline, and cut just the straw layer down to the brim edge and put my wire along that edge. Then you can smooth the crinoline back over that wire to enclose it. And then you can whip stitch your wire on and whip stitch your binding down. And it becomes sort of a, a self finishing edge uh, when you wire a, an aspartery edge. So take out your phone and take a picture of this slide if you would like to look up books that I recommend with more information on espartery. Um, when I was doing the research, well before I inherited this stuff from Madame Sheeta, I, began, I kept a, a list of, of books that referred to espartery and had techniques and advice for how to use it. Um, and these are the ones that I think are the best. Um, and really the, the, the Denise Dreyer book, the second one on this list, From the Neck Up, that was the book that I read in 1992 as the textbook in my millinery class that has excellent photographs of what aspartery is um, and a demonstration of how to do a sweeping sideband for a top hat. Um, it's really good. She's got a lot of, of concrete material about how to work